Welcome to the Democracies College podcast series. This podcast focuses on educational equity, justice, and excellence for all students in P20 educational pathways. This podcast is a product of the Office of Community College Research and Leadership, or OCCRL, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Learn more about OCCRL at occrl.illinois.edu. In this episode, Francina Turner from OCCRL talks with Dr. Emilia Parnell, the Vice President for Research and Policy at NASPA, about strategies that student affairs professionals can engage in to support diverse community college collegians. Okay, we'll go right into the to the first question. So Dr. Parnell, you have a rich career from being a policy analyst for the Florida legislature to serving as director of research initiatives for the Association of Institutional Research to your current role as VP for research and policy for NASPA. Please share what attracted you to the field of higher education. So uh, I guess I should be honest and tell you that I really did not know about higher education as a field of study until I got through my master's work, which I chose business. And so my my real career goal as an 18 year old was to go into corporate America. And so I didn't really have higher education or anything associated with it on my radar. But I like to think of it as kind of, you know, serendipitous. I ended up at a at a university as an internal auditor soon after I finished my master's degree. And that's honestly what gave me the chance to learn a lot about how institutions operate. And so I shared an office with a colleague and, you know, month after month after month, as I was doing my work, I would come back to him and ask him big strategy focused questions like, why does the institution do this or why did they do that? You know, have they considered this or have they considered that? And out of the blue, he said, have you ever considered, you know, getting a degree in higher education administration? And I said, well, no, why do you, why do you ask that? And he said, because you are annoying me. Now he didn't mean that like in a mean way, but it was truly, you have so many questions that you need to um, dig into and they're really big strategic questions you might want to consider researching this. And so that's honestly what got me into higher education, but it's in terms of what has attracted me and made me want to stay, I think it's truly um, something much more uh, heartfelt and that I, I really do think of higher education as a vehicle to help people pursue their dreams and in some instances change their life circumstances. So now that um, I'm in those positions that you named. So I'm researching topics that influence students. I'm discussing and writing about policies that should help them. I'm working with institutions about how they can gather more useful data to allocate resources appropriately. It seems like all of my prior work experiences are now starting to come together. So as long as I have opportunities to do those things, I'll stay attracted to the field. Going further, in your role as VP for research and policy for NASPA, You have steered work on co-curricular transcripts and comprehensive student records. As it is important to capture learning beyond the classroom, can you share more, and in particular, the findings specific to the community colleges that were part of the project? This really connects to this notion that sometimes community colleges, because of their commuter feel and that students are coming and going frequently, and and in most cases, they're not living on the premises that perhaps maybe out of classroom or co-curricular opportunities are just not there. And I would say it's actually the opposite. So community colleges offer lots of clubs, activities, service experiences, all types of things to help students gain proficiencies, particularly in job-ready skills. So from the project, aspect, NASPA partnered with ACRO, so that's the um, Registrar and Admissions Officers Association, and we worked with 12 schools to help them do more focused work on getting students engaged in the co-curricular, and not just that, but documenting what they've been learning and what they've been doing. And so two community colleges that stand out, two from the project are Borough of Manhattan Community College, um, which has had a co-curricular transcript for years to document all the things they've been offering. Even before they became a part of the project, they were doing this because they thought that was just the right direction to go and to equip students with something that they could use to tell their story. And similarly, LaGuardia Community College, they're doing an e-portfolio as well as badges because they have so many hands-on learning experiences, service opportunities, and just all types of fun ways to keep learners engaged with the institution. So I'd say the findings that are specific to community colleges is that they really do have a lot in common with many other institutions that are saying the co-curricular environment is ripe with opportunities for students to learn um, and get practical experiences. And so um, I, I would challenge the assumption that students on those campuses couldn't have just as much of a rich experience. I would definitely agree. Um, my formal edu- formal high education started at the community college level, and mm-hmm. I was able to take part in so many activities. So I'm a strong proponent of community co- community college students being active. Excellent on campus. 
What opportunities does NASPA provide community college practice practitioners and researchers? You know, I probably put them into a couple of different buckets. Uh, my role at NASPA, as, as you mentioned, is that I lead our research and policy work. So I'll talk about those two things first. We're, from the research perspective, we're definitely getting into more core issues related to higher education. So bigger and broader themes, particularly related to how students learn, which environments they learn in, how they pay for college, all sorts of things. And so from our research perspective, anytime we're looking at specific issues like emergency aid to help students or even the co-curricular uh, learning opportunities that you just mentioned, or how we provide high quality advising, we always try to make sure that we get the community college perspective in there. So we do a number of surveys um, where we're talking to VPs of student affairs or even front level staff or you know, mid-level managers and we're asking them, how are you providing timely resources to students? If we ever do a study and we don't have a strong enough representation for community colleges, we have to go back um, to the field because it wouldn't provide the balanced narrative that we need to um, in order to influence our professional development offerings. So from there, I'll, I'll segue into professional development. You know, at the core, NASPA is a membership association to help student affairs professionals, you know, get the skills and tools they need to do their jobs better. So we definitely welcome community to engage with community colleges. So we have a, as, I don't know if everybody knows, but we have a dedicated community colleges division, which is comprised of community college leaders from across the country, and they meet regularly and talk about issues for to that student population. We also have a community colleges institute, which focuses on effective practice, and it gives professionals a chance to network and share with each other. And then I say the third bucket is our policy work, which is where we keep community colleges in mind as we examine all types of higher ed issues like um, borrower repayment. So, you know, the tax legislation that's going through right now, that's definitely uh, relevant to community colleges. If we talk about issues related to concealed carry or sexual violence, those are also issues that are not specific to one institution type. And we want to elevate the voice of um, the community college perspective, too. So I know those last few examples are not the, the most happy examples, but I can I can say the policy can be fun. Um, but in all those areas, research, policy, and professional development, we're looking to, to provide a more holistic set of resources for um, practitioners and researchers to engage with NASPA. Along the same lines, I found that there are community colleges that don't have standalone student activities offices or student government organizations. And considering what we just talked about in terms of uh, the necessity of certain skills and experience to uh, transfer and employment outcomes, could you talk a little bit about this and the assumption that non-traditional, most often non-traditional by age students, aren't interested in engaging on campus outside of the classroom? Oh, yeah, abs absolutely. I would definitely challenge the assumption that learners who are not traditionally aged are less interested in engaging with the campus outside the classroom. Um, and it's because I think those narratives are put forward mostly because of the profile of students that we see in front of us about community colleges. So, for instance, we, we hear the narrative that they're often part time, or that they work lots of hours. But I honestly think that working and attending part time are, are really not exclusive to community college students anymore. And I think if you look at the profile of today's college students, it's changing in that many more of them, both at community colleges and four-year institutions, are working while they attend college. So the example I probably would give you to support my challenge of the assumption is um, the state university system of New York. So SUNY, the system, has several community colleges in it, and they have been doing an applied learning initiative for at least the past three to four years. And so they break that applied learning program up into three areas. So they have SUNY Works, which looks at cooperative education, practical experiences, and internships. They have SUNY Serves, which looks at service learning and community service, civic engagement, and volunteering. And then they have SUNY Discovers, which focuses on kind of field study and entrepreneurship and things like that. So within the SUNY example and the community colleges that are part of that applied learning initiative, it may not be that every student is interested in all those different types of things that I mentioned, but honestly, going by the participation of community colleges in that system and a part of that initiative, I think that it's safe to say that community colleges um, students are definitely inter interested. I think we just have to make the offerings more flexible so that we can consider their balance of work and school and family and other demands. But honestly, like I said, con considering today's college students, that's not an issue that's core and specific only to community college students. So long-winded answer, I can say that I would challenge the assumption that uh, learners who attend community colleges are not interested. I think they're very interested. I think it's on us to make the experiences more flexible for them, but they would definitely participate. I definitely agree. Among your research interests and expertise is student engagement and how student involvement, volunteerism, and campus organization membership affects retention. What role have you found student affairs professionals to play uh, play in fostering academic and social engagement that aids student persistence? 
Uh, well, I say, I think we have several roles, but if I had to list one at the top, it'd probably be that of connector. So mm -hmm. as you know, student affairs professionals, we work at institutions. And if, if we have a, a mission that's holistic or hybrid or the idea that integrated learning should be occurring, basically that what students are learning outside the classroom should connect really closely or as closely as possible to what they're learning inside the classroom. And student affairs professionals will be the ones that individually <laughs> nudge students to connect their learning in that type of way. So, you know, they're, they're looking at the places where learning happens. And I do think that to the extent that student affairs professionals can put that type of framing around learning for students and talk to them and, and encourage them to, to start thinking holistically about their learning and how they might document that in an e-portfolio or a co-curricular transcript, how they might tell their story even before they graduate, I think students will start to see college as being worth their investment and they'll make more effort to stay on the campus. Um, a second way I'd say in, in terms of connectors is that we have the capacity to connect students to mentors. And I'll give you an example with that. Um, Clemson University has their university professional internship co-op program. It's called UPIC. And so their career and professional development office runs it. But basically, in the, in the past several years, they have placed hundreds of students from all types of financial backgrounds in paid on-campus work positions. And in those positions, they pair students with mentors who help them both develop, of course, job-ready skills, but they also mentor them about all types of things they'll need once they, they finish college. And so I think an underexplored but soon-to-be extra-explored area of research will be the impact of on-campus employment, and not just for the purpose of earning a wage. And, and um, work study is fine, but I'm, I'm thinking about the number of student affairs divisions that hire students um, in housing. They hire them in recreation, dining services, other auxiliary services, and those types of on-campus work experiences both help the student connect their learning um, tangible ways with what they're doing in the classroom, and it also connects them to professionals on the campus they can make relationships with. So I think all those things add value for the student, and they see the investment, the, a whole lot of money, as being worth it for them. And I think that as we say that, um, the, the, as we've seen the literature show, students who are more engaged and connected to the institution will likely persist longer than those who probably don't feel that way. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. In an article published on higher education today, you wrote about several ways student affairs professionals could serve as change agents with racial diversity and student activism around inclusion, support, and retention. How might student affairs professionals best reach or engage students who may be skeptical and disheartened by university decisions or actions? So I, I read the questions that you gave me ahead of time, and this is the one that I think I spent the most time uh, thinking about because it's so relevant, mm -hmm. honestly, considering everything that's going on right now. <clears throat> if I had to frame it in a, in a way that seems tangible, I might suggest that it all starts with the mission of the institution and how decisions are made and, and to what extent those decisions connect to the mission. So considering today's racial, political, social financial climate, I can totally understand why students would be skeptical, uh, disheartened, as you mentioned, and even maybe disappointed with the way that their institution is making decisions. But I think that leads to my next point. To some extent, I imagine that maybe students might have less of those feelings if the institution pushed harder to be more thoughtful and thorough with explaining how those decisions are made and how those decisions connect back to the mission. So what I'm talking about is strategic communication. And that type of work um, takes a lot of time and it's really hard. And a lot of times things are happening really quickly. Your influence of social media makes it hard to get the narrative out there consistently, um, thoroughly, and, and to the right students at the right time. But I think it's necessary because typically one main question that students will probably have is why? You know, why did the institution take this position? Why did they do this? Why did they not do that? And I would imagine that senior leaders are having to make lots of tough decisions all the time, but to the extent that they can talk to students or explain to them clearly and, make, and help them be more informed about how those decisions connect back to the mission, it might ease a little bit of the skepticism. Now, to be honest, I don't think that institutions will ever be able to make every student or every professional or administrator in the campus community happy all at the same time, but considering how much money we accept from students, students from them to come to our institutions, I think it's fair for them to ask the question of why, you know, often and in a lot of different contexts. And it's, it's, um, it's on us to provide clear, good rationale for how our decisions connect back to the institutional mission. Thank you. So my last question is, what call to action or advice would you offer our listeners relative to engaging diverse students and promoting equitable student learning outcomes at two and four year institutions of higher learning? Well, this is the easy one. I, I think it's not easy work, but it's the easiest um, suggestion for me to offer. And it's something that doesn't really cost a lot of dollars and cents. It's, it's the investment of time. And I'd say make time to talk to students. And it sounds simple, but it's really very, very, very necessary. I think every student 
will always have a different story about how college impacts them and influences them and why they choose uh, to make an investment in higher education. And so I think that we have to continuously fill you know, our minds and our hearts with those stories because it makes us more flexible and thoughtful leaders and practitioners. And it helps us stay connected to why we do this work. So we have to make it intentional. We have to make time for it. So in terms of practical um, examples and suggestions I'd offer, I'd say, you know, invite a invite a few students that you don't know that have had very little, if any, contact with to go to lunch with you on the campus. And then after the lunch, follow up via email. Let them know that you're available and you're accessible should they have any questions or should they just want to know a little bit about more, more about, about, in case they want to know a little bit more about what's going on on the campus. How's that for a long sentence? <laughs> Um, so first, if you see a, a group of students sitting together, especially a group um, that seem to represent a diverse background, you know, go over and ask them if you can sit and talk for a while. And if you do, ask them if their experience with the institution is what they thought it would be. And if they say no, and it relates to something that you can address, you know, ask them, can you keep in touch? I think that for all students, particularly those from diverse backgrounds, they want to feel like their voice is being heard. They want to feel like their concerns matter and that they actually belong at the institution. And I feel like we, as professionals of all types, not just student affairs, we can help with that. And so it's a large task. It's a time-consuming task. But if we each commit to helping directly a few students and we multiply that by all the student affairs professionals and all the other administrators on a campus, we could really cover a lot of ground. So my advice is just, you know, get out of the office a little bit, you know, make some time. If you got 30 minutes and you were planning to have lunch at your desk, uh, you know, pick a student and ask if they have some time to sit and chat with you. And they'll probably look at you like, are you, are you serious? Like, why do you want to talk to me? <laughs> but you, you would be surprised the number of students who would be really, really um, impacted by just saying someone from the campus took time to, to speak with me and didn't want something from me and didn't want me to do anything extra, but just really want to hear my voice about, you know, how my experience is going. So that's my advice. Um, I know it sounds, you know, cheesy, but I really think it makes a big difference. Um, actually, I don't think it sounds cheesy. And the reason for that is that I've been um, a part of conversations like that, <clears throat> both here and at my previous institutions. And students can really tell when um, an administrator or a professor, or even a staff member, we can tell when they're genuine. Mm -hmm. And when we know they're genuine, it really goes a long way. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, in my opinion, student affairs professionals have, have talked so many students off the ledge. Right, right. Um, so I, I think that's awesome. I agree. I mean, I think there there are definitely going to be positions, and we I think we get the luxury in student affairs of having close contact with students. You know, we're running the programs that students come to outside of the classroom, so we have a lot of access to them. But there are a lot of other functional units. And I won't name them specifically to kind of you know call them out, but I think you, we probably could all name a couple functions that probably don't need to interact with students very much, and students might not even know who work in those offices. And so I think we as student affairs could lead the way and, and pull a colleague from another office uh, together. Not, I'm not saying five professionals to one student. That's, <laughs> that's intimidating. You know, mm -hmm. but, but it might be that maybe we partner with another functional unit and do like a lunch and learn and invite students to say, hey, this is your business office. This is your registrar's office. This is your admissions office. Do you know how these functions work together um, to give you the best experience possible? So again, you know, it's, a, it's more time and I'm definitely not talking about a new initiative. I know initiative fatigue is real. <laughs> um, but what I am suggesting is that, you know, we work on a campus and students are there coming and going all the time. If we don't take a, a moment to talk to them just because, not because we want something from them. I think we miss an opportunity to get the real and relevant perspective of what they're, what they're experiencing. And it, like, like I said, college costs a lot of money. <laughs> so, Definitely. you know, I, I know that we get those surveys from any other thing that we invest in from airline tickets to, you know, Amazon, they want to know how your experience is. But I think we, it's important that we do that from a customer service standpoint for students as well. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for agreeing to do this podcast today. And I'm thank you very much for having me and for the invitation. It was, it was a pleasure to, uh, to talk with you today. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. For more information about supporting diverse collegians through student affairs, we recommend that you explore the resources available through NASPA at www.naspa.org. For more podcasts, links to today's recommended resources, or to share your comments and suggestions, visit occrl.illinois.edu slash democracy or send them via Twitter at OCCRL. Tune in next month when Vilma Mesa, Associate Professor of Education at the University of Michigan, talks with Dr. Tatiana Mergisio, Associate Professor at USC's Rossier's School of Education, about equity-minded approaches to mathematics education. Background music for this podcast is provided by DubLab. Thank you for listening and for your contributions to educational equity, justice, and excellence for all students.